Hello and welcome to the second online presentation of the VCS. Tonight we're going to have a wonderful presentation by uh, several very distinguished people. Uh, Diana Golden, who is a member of the VCS, wonderful cellist, and did her doctoral dissertation on music from Haiti. Uh, and the title of the presentation is Tan Bu Kashe and all the music on the CD that she produced um, for New Focus recordings uh, is written by Haitian composers. And we will be joined by one of those Haitian composers, Rudy Perrault, who is uh, on the faculty at the University of Minnesota in Duluth. We will also be joined by distinguished professor Rebecca Dirksen, who is also a specialist in Haitian music and uh, will tell us all about things that uh, many of us have never heard before. We'll also be joined by Robin Derby, distinguished professor at UCLA uh, in Latin American history, who is my cousin. And last but certainly not least, Stacy Krim, the wonderful curator, curator uh, at the University of North Carolina Greensboro, where the VCS archive now lives. So it is my great pleasure to introduce all four of them, five of them, excuse me, and uh, I hope you enjoy the presentation tonight. Thank you. Now, there was obviously a decline in this bustling high society type uh, live performance during the 13 year revolution that led to the Haitian independence in 1804. Yet fanfare or brass and percussion foot bands were a prominent part of the landscape as revolutionary leaders Toussaint Louverture and Jean-Jacques Dessalines both had their own musical ensembles to accompany their infantries. And after independence, King Henri Christophe renewed enthusiasm and support for the fine arts in his court. Were we able to step back in time, we could probably expect to be regaled with musical entertainment at his Palais Saint-Souci, which you see here. Uh, Christophe's example in some ways was emulated by subsequent leaders of the country, including 19th century President Fabre Geffrard and 20th century President Paul Magloire, who both founded important national schools of music during their respective times in office. While neither of their conservatories um, is any longer in existence, today there are a number of music schools across the country. Alongside these concerted efforts to cultivate music education and performance, the 19th century to the present has seen island-born composers rise to national and international acclaim. Among the historical composers with the greatest name recognition today, and whose works are partially available if you were to really search for them, are Oxyde Gentil, Edmond Saint-Ange, Ludovic Lamotte, Justin Lee, Wiener Jägerhuber, Franz Cassius, Carmen Bouar, Lina Maton, and Julio Racine. And you can see I've run out of space yeah. there. Um, with regard to all of the composers that are uh, well known beyond Haiti's borders and who I would encourage you to look into. Um, now, significantly, many of these composers who often received uh, advanced training in Europe or North America sought to create music that would somehow signify Haiti as a nation, thus involving themselves with larger projects of musical nationalism and patriotism. In doing so, they often drew inspiration from folklorized Vodou sacred practices and articulations of popular folklore. Cassius's Suite Haitienne, which is found on the Tambou Caché album, for example, roughly alludes to both sacred rhythms and rhythms for work and play in its four movements, Petro, Yambalu, Mascaon, and Combit. Today, we are seeing an exciting resurgence of creativity from Haitian and Haitian heritage composers, including Jean-Rudy Perrault, who's hopefully with us this evening, and also David Bontin, Sidney Guillaume, Sabrina Jean-Louis, uh, Daniel Bernard Roumain, and so on. Each bring a wealth of talents and ideas to their compositions that are so worth your time. So please, if you don't know these composers already, uh, go take a listen. Besides the pieces by Rudy and Wu Men on Tambou Caché, Sabrina Jean-Louis has also written exquisitely for cello. 
Uh, and while I'll reserve the space for Rudy to speak about his own work and creative process, I will make the observation that contemporary composers are frequently drawing out broader connections of lived experience well beyond any national borders, as in the piece Brother Malcolm, also on the album, which imagines a conversation between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. on the inauguration of Barack Obama as US president. And um, for the strength of its symbolism, that 2008 election was observed with intense interest from Haiti as the first independent black nation in the world and the second independent nation in the Western hemisphere. DBR, um, Daniel Bernard Wumen, similarly, is well known for his anti-racist activism and efforts to use his musical platform as a means to fight for the sanctity of life and to affirm and uphold black people and their cultures. So we've established, however, briefly a long tradition of music education and composition, but there's some key structural obstacles that have um, kept probably most of you, even as professional musicians, from knowing much about this repertoire. There's the question of how we understand the classical music canon and what's important to keep fresh in our current performing and teaching pra uh, practices. Um, a premise that has faced increasing challenges over the past two or three decades or so, and which Diana will discuss a little bit more. Um, another uh, thing is that um, much of this repertoire is exceedingly difficult to track down, um, largely because much of it has not been formally published, or if it has been, it's either out of print or was self-published in very limited runs that are not generally available outside of Haiti. Now, there are a few rare exceptions to this, such as Justin Eli, who had um, a number of his pieces published by the edition Carl Fisher, and who made it to US airwaves and Hollywood by composing for radio shows and silent films. But most of this entire repertoire remains in manuscript form. And we do not, in fact, understand the entirety of what this um, creative repertoire ever was, and we will probably never have a complete handle on, on the breadth of what existed. Um, that means that um, for you to find um, what is available, um, you will need to head to an archive. Um, the one archive that is likely most accessible to uh, you is going to be the, the music ar archive that is associated with the Société de Recherche et de Diffusion de la Musique Haïtienne, or um, SRDMH, which is in Montreal. And um, they can be contacted directly through its director, uh, Dr. Claude Dauphin. Um, I, re I recommend heading there first because you can handle um, your inquiries via email and mail correspondence. And this is the archive that is best set up to handle copyright matters, which are very, very important. So um, here are a few examples of manuscripts that you can see um, are copied by hand um, painstakingly. Um, and so orchestras throughout Haiti um, would uh, typically uh, see these cards um, copied by hand and everybody would have to um, play off these very small um, pieces of um, score um, as they were performing. All right. Um, in addition, I want to highlight, as my time is coming to an end, the um, that while SRDMH, the archive in Montreal, is a wealth of um, rich resources for us as performers, um, in fact, the bulk of what exists remains in private archives. And by private archives, I don't mean any formal institution. I mean rather that these are collections that are essentially held in people's homes. And um, as you can imagine, most of us are not equipped to be able to um, handle archival collections. And so we have a lot of concerns with regard to basic infrastructure in terms of just having the facilities to be able to safely store and maintain these, um, these scores as documents that are valuable um, as um, patrimony, as um, heritage uh, documents. Um, there are other um, very common infrastructural challenges in Haiti uh, to deal with, uh, especially within the, the private sector and in, in homes um, where people are living. Um, and that, that includes the very fundamental um, challenge that most people face in not having electricity 24 seven. 
So that um, in a warm tropical climate um, means that there is no sense of um, you know uh, heating or cooling to maintain these heritage documents, which many are now um, quite old in the ideal circumstances to um, maintain generation after generation. In addition, some other challenges that we're looking at are um, political instability, which is a recurring and very complicated um, challenge that we're not really going to get into right now, but that um, poses um, a number of, of really difficult obstacles to those who have these private archives. And then the final thing I want to point out are um, challenges of climate and the environment that um, uh, pose a lot of um, precarity for these heritage documents. Um, so this is um, a the original score or uh, a part for um, a mass by Werner Jägerhuber, and you can see that it has be, been eaten by termites. Um, other environmental um, climate issues that people have to deal with are um, humidity, mold, um, all sorts of um, besides termites, there are silverfish and other uh, types of bugs that can get into the paper and uh, eat away at it. Um, and then more um, profoundly on the level of climate change and increasing occurrence of hurricanes. So this then has perpetuated the situation of um, hidden archives and accidental archivists um, that is really maintaining the bulk of this material. So now here's the challenge as we're trying to expand what it is that we can do as performers, um, how do we come to share this music if it's um, really not available? Well, this is where the work of um, institutions such as Bloom IT or Crossing Borders um, come in as well as what Diana uh, is doing as a performer to record this materials. Uh, these materials. So um, with all of these obstacles, I really want to highlight uh, the value of listening uh, to uh, this, this album and others like it as we continue to expand what it means to be a performing musician uh, today. So with that, I'm going to hand everything over to Diana and we'll continue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, Kate, did we want to play a little bit from from the album um, Rudy's piece still around, um, <laughs> which is he, he would say um, it's not a piece that would suggest um, Haitian rhythms or melodies. It's uh, a piece he'll be hopefully talking about later um, this evening, but. With, with the title of the album, Tambu Kashe, Hidden Drum, you, you really can't hear this is a Haitian composition. This is a composition um, that uses the, um, the, the spells out um, different letters in a poem called Still Around. much Rebecca for that amazing brilliant introduction of, uh, to Haitian music and a little bit about the history of archives and um, it's, it's so valuable to have that context um, and thank you to Kate Dillingham and the VCS for holding this event today for those of you just joining I'm Diana Golden a New York City based um, freelance cellist and VCS member um, and this album, Tambu Kashe, features music by composers of Haitian descent, 
Um, I'd like to give a short background on the album and then we'll brainstorm a little bit about what constitutes the cello music canon and how inclusion in the canon is shaped by a variety of factors besides artistry. And lastly, we can look at how we can continually expand the, our conception of the cello music canon um, to kind of contribute to an ever-evolving musical conversation. So I became interested in Haitian music actually when I was working um, for a music center in Boston centered around um, Boston's Haitian community in 2011 and 2012. And um, at this music center, the students learned and performed their own folk music. So I was curious to learn alongside them um, a little bit about folk music. And I started performing um, Haitian classical or art music um, around that time. My interests continued as I visited Jacques Mel, Haiti, um, to teach at the Desse Baptiste Music School in 2012. Um, thanks to Jen Anthony, who's with us tonight with Bloom Haiti. Um, and then my interest continued further as I researched um, Haitian music for my doctorate in cello performance at Rutgers University. Many of the works on the album are housed at the archive in Montreal that Rebecca mentioned, SRDMH. And I visited this archive in 2016. I wanted to record these works for cello um, because several of them had not been recorded before or even performed. And also I wanted to bring awareness to these composers and the work that they're doing, the, the ones who are still with us. Um, in October 2020, um, Tambu Cache was released on the New Focus Recordings label and distributed by Naxos. And on the CD are works by Justin Eli, Werner Jäger Huber, Franz Casseus, Carmen Pruard, Julia Racine, Daniel Bernard Rumain, and Jean Rudy Perrault, who hopefully will be here with us tonight to share his experiences. Um, this recording spans a large variety of styles and um, has a timeline ranging from the 20th to the 21st centuries. And composers who are Haitian American, Haitian Canadian, and those who are based in Haiti. Rather than attempting to claim one national musical voice with this album, we tried to show a variety of compositional tastes um, with each composer and what unique attributes they each bring to this ongoing musical conversation on um, art music. Haiti has a rich tradition of creating classical music that dates back centuries. Now I'd like to ask each of you, and you can raise your hand if you like, how many of you have heard classical music by Haitian composers before? <laughs> And if there's a history of Haitian music that has been around for hundreds of years, why might you um, not have heard about it? On the radio, in music history classes, in publishers, catalogs, in concerts. Haitian anthropologist Michel Wolf Trouillot writes in his Silencing the Past, Power in the Production of History that any historical narrative is a bundle of silences. He goes on to say that silences entered the process of historical production at four crucial moments. The moment of fact creation, or the making of sources. The moment of fact assembly, or the making of archives. The moment of fact retrieval, which is the making of narratives. And what he calls the moment of retrospective significance, or the making of history in the final instance. So in other words, for every piece of music that gets created and published, others are not afforded these resources. For every score that gets included in a library, others are not given this opportunity. For scores that aren't found as easily in libraries, they are not as readily included in musical records. And for scores that are not as readily included in musical records, they are not as readily included as part of our music histories. 
And I thought Trujillo's uh, framework on historical issues of preservation in archives might be helpful for our discussion. I want to be clear that I'm not promoting disregarding music we might already know and love, but rather that we can examine what else there is to explore, to love playing and to share with audiences as part of a continual, continuously expanding canon. Throughout the history of uh, the modern cello and its earlier predecessors, cellists and goggle players have always worked to expand the canon and what could be done with our instruments, as we were not willing to let violinists hog the soloist spotlight. But the composer as genius trope has existed as far back as Plato and shapes the entry gates, not only for which composers we allow into the canon, but also which ones are kept there, further perpetuating the perception of the canon as a fixed entity. So um, what constitutes the canon? Who traditionally has been in the position to choose what is included in the canon? What barriers have certain groups faced in getting into such positions of access as musicologists, composers, and performers? Or barriers faced in the publishing of musical research, compositions, and recordings? For example, Haitian composer Carmen Brua, who lived from 1909 to 2005, and spent a lifetime working as a performer, pedagogue, and composer, one of the most accomplished Haitian composers, still worried about her legacy. She performed on tours across the Caribbean as a concert pianist, had been educated at the Paris Conservatory, lived at different times in France, Haiti, and Canada, helped to establish the SRDMH archive, and still she did not work with a publishing company it is difficult to find recordings of her work as a composer or performer. And she's not well known outside of Haitian music circles, despite her longevity rivaling Elliot Carter's. Conservatories emphasize teaching about Western European classical composers, even while composers in the classical style have had their own art music traditions elsewhere in the world. Non-Western uh, non European music history courses seem to become labeled as ethnomusicology, world music, or other, and often receive less attention and funding since they are not graduation requirements in the curriculum. For conservatory auditions, students who perform what is perceived to be outside the canon are viewed suspiciously as though they do not have the technique or training required for canon favorites. I actually played Rudy Perot's Brother Malcolm for one of my doctoral auditions. The feedback I heard was that I should have chosen a Beethoven sonata instead. And soon after the audition, I received a concert invitation um, from the same teacher for a program of Beethoven, Schumann, and Brahms. Um, during my doctoral degree at Rutgers, I was advised by one professor not to choose Haitian music as my research topic, as he said it would be an unsuitable topic for research. And I can only imagine how it must feel to encounter this kind of resistance to diversifying the canon as a performer, composer, or researcher within an underrepresented um, group in, in classical music. Needless to say, I ignored his recommendation and uh, then invited the professor to be on my committee so that he could learn alongside me how much there is to offer in the field of Haitian music studies. Students who have completed their training then go on to teach and they teach what they know. So um, they teach what they've been taught and from the music library that they already have. There's pressure to teach set repertoire lists that may further exclude uh, BIPOC, LGBTQ, and women composers, and composers of varied geographical areas. Curriculums are handed to private teachers from youth and school orchestras and state-sponsored musical organizations and method books are often strongly encouraged by, uh, for use by community music schools and in the schools. As in, if you want to get or keep this job, this is the repertoire that you teach. These manuals and method books are often exclusionary sets of repertoire, and some widely used method books are not only exclusionary, but currently have racist songs included in their series. As I'm sure many of you know from your own experiences, inclusion of cello music in the canon is shaped by various forces besides artistic merit. 
So how can we continually expand the canon as performers, recording artists, presenters, and teachers? Here are just a few thoughts, and we welcome your ideas during the Q&A portion of tonight's event as well. By seeing the canon as though it is an ongoing conversation between many artists always evolving, not a fixed and predetermined literature that necessarily pre uh, preferences old over new, known over unknown, or certain heritages and cultural traditions over others. And for artist researchers through archival research, taking the time to research something new for our teaching and our performance programming. This could be attending a concert at which you don't already know the composer's names, doing reading sessions, making it a regular part of your practice to listen to new works, finding companion pieces that offer similar techniques and teaching points to your go-to pieces, and looking to composer databases. Audience members often say, I don't know anything about music, so I don't know if my impression means anything. And then they relate their very valid personal experiences in listening to the music. We all have the expertise to evaluate whether a piece has musical merit, is interesting, or is meaningful on a personal level, without a textbook telling us we should idolize the composer because they were previously idolized. We can also provide repertoire suggestions to musical organizations that are setting and shaping knowledge of repertoires for the next generation. And uh, for presenters, trusting audiences that they'll be receptive of works they have not heard before. Um, presenters can make a specific commitment to programming works of underrepresented composers and can look at concert programs to see if they're actually following through on their commitment with the number of works by underrepresented composers that are programmed or commissioned, not just by offering a tokenized concert theme or one token piece per program. While the focus today is on composers, presenters, and arts organizations can also take a look at hiring practices, representation on boards, executive committees, and on stage, works given critical reviews, musicians highlighted in publications, and so forth. And for performers and recording artists, when we per perform and record works by contemporary composers, it helps to enter these works into the historical record of music making. Diversifying the canon also makes the classical wor world more inviting for young BIPOC musicians to be included in this traditionally white community and to have a sense of belonging. At this time, um, we'll play another short clip from Rudy's uh, Rudy Perot's Still Around. And then if he's present, I would love to turn the floor to him to discuss his music and um, his experiences. Okay, um, I think that was fantastic. But, um, we uh, would love to include some other voices on this on this Zoom call. One is uh, my lovely cousin, Lauren Derby, Robin Derby. She teaches at the University of California, Los Angeles. She's in uh, in the Latin American histor history department. And you know, I, I, I just have to, to, to just remind everybody that in fact, we are a cello society. And that uh, in order to continue the wonderful work that we do, uh, creatively and otherwise is is by support and not just from cellists but from people who love cello and one of the things that uh, I've been talking about with the board since I became president is uh, seeding a fund for commissioning people of color to write more music for us uh, and to have a, uh, a living archive hence the title of this whole presentation, A Living Archive, which shows not only that we, we living people who play this 300-year-old instrument are, are inspiring and encouraging people to continue to write for us. Um, it's, it's a very important part of our, of our culture and bringing us forward uh, for the next generation 
Um, so I, I would like to open it up to questions. If anyone would like to speak uh, or, or, or ask a question or type a question in the chat, please go right ahead. I know we have some um, very distinguished people on, on, on the call here. So Robin, if you're nearby, if you'd like to say something, uh, that would be super great. Um, well, I, I, I want to commend uh, Rebecca and, also, and Diana for this really, um, yeah, I mean, Diana, of course, you know, today is a celebration of this album, but I'm just really um, so astounded by the work that both, both of you are doing to collect and preserve Haitian classical music. It's so, it's so important. And I guess I, I had a question about, uh, you know, I am a historian and how do, you know, the, if, if maybe Diana, you could say a little bit about the, um, about the periodization, because, you know, in, in your work, like what are the periods in Haitian uh, or the genres, I guess, periods and genres in Haitian, Haitian classical com uh, composition that you, that your work is focused on and that you sh are showcasing in your album? Sure. Um, I would, I would go maybe composer by composer. So in Justin Ali's work, um, it was a little bit more uh, impressionist um, pieces about the Haitian landscape um, and not sort of direct uh, quotes from folk music, but general um, impressions evoking um, evoking Haiti. That was a style that Justin Ailey and, and other composers of that time um, brought out. Justin Ailey also had works that were influenced by um, Arawak uh, groups in Haiti, um, an indigenous group. And he, uh, as Rebecca said, was published by Carl Fisher, but Carl Fisher um, promoted sort of the exoticizing of um, Haitian themes so it, it was a double-edged sword. Yes, he wanted to uh, emphasize his Haitian heritage, but he also wanted to have his works be more mass-produced and palatable for foreign audiences. Um, let's see, going down the line, Franz Casseus, uh was considered the father of Haitian guitar music. Um, his... Haitian suite that is represented on the album um, and and arranged by Julia Racine. It, you can hear some um, rhythms like uh, Yan Valu rhythm or Petro rhythm, which are from voodoo um, ceremonies and kind of stylized in this in this Haitian suite for uh, solo guitar, and then this arrangement is for cello and piano. Um, I, I think we mentioned in Rudy's pieces, um, the two that are on these on this album, uh, Brother Malcolm has an African um, theme, uh, but it, it has a title um, inspired by the U.S. election. He would say those two are not necessarily um, Haitianized writing as much as his uh, string quartet, for, for instance, performed by Crossing Borders on one of their albums. Um, let's see what else there is. I, I tried in the in the album to pick uh, certain composers who wrote for cello who are represented of representative of different styles. Um, so then you have Daniel Bernard Roumain, who is also a contemporary um, Haitian composer who feels um, he would like to bring out his um, Haitian heritage. He's Haitian American. Um, he would like to celebrate his, um, his roots and um, Every contemporary composer has kind of a different approach in that um, some may feel more linked to their time in Haiti or their family in Haiti 
or, you know, the Haitian experience and some might feel like I'm just a composer who happens to be Haitian and this is my unique style. So um, it really just depends on each individual composer, if that answers your question. <laughs> Bernard Gauthier also is um, considered a really important um, Haitian composer. He transcribed um, uh, Haitian folk melodies and, and put them into classical music so that um, kind of elite audiences would not um, stigmatize the voodoo um, origins of the melodies once you take the text away from the melodies and put them as classical pieces, uh, you know, for string quartet, they, they embraced um, the, the voodoo uh, link to the the Haitian folk melodies. Mm -hmm. I'll just interject. Welcome, Rudy. Um, <laughs> so everyone, this is Rudy Perrault, who's uh, two two examples of pieces he wrote for the album for Diana. Uh, Diana's album Tambu Caché is here to jo to join us. And Rudy, take it away. Tell us about your music. Tell us about your your approach to writing and, and cello specifically. Um, and thank you for, for the invitation and, and, and the opportunity to talk about uh, what my music and then the challenges and successes of, of um, BIPOC's uh, composer with BIPOC. Um, so I, I will jump right in and be blunt. Um, I'm not known for diplomacy as I'm sure Janet will, will agree there. Um, I will start with the underrepresentation of uh, BIPOCs in classical music, um, not just as members of, of major symphonic orchestras, but uh, which we all know to be that percentage to be uh, dismal, but um, the even more bleak number of BIPOCs um, composers and conductors. Um, before we go too far, you know, I, I think I read in uh, Diana's uh, remark that she was talking about uh, uh, her advisor. I'm not sure if, if, if she, you still covered that. Um, the, she mentioned that her advisor, the recommendation not to choose Haitian music has, as a research topic. And, and, you know, I'd like to share my sort of uh, utter disappointment with that recommendation. You know, I, and I'm glad that you did not listen and follow through with with what you wanted. Um, as far as I know, candidates are usually uh, encouraged to pick an area of, an, of interest for their dissertations and a topic that is unique or has, has been overlooked or uh, rarely discussed. Um, how, you know, how many more uh, dissertation on the Beethoven cello sonatas do we need? Uh, just that's something that's more interesting and uh, something that's new. I think it's better. Anyway, we can trace the we can trace the underrepresentation of BIPOC uh, composers in classical music way back to the founding of this country. You know, the original sin. Uh, not not that anywhere else uh, was any better. You know, we we know about uh, Joseph Boulogne, for example. He was an extremely gifted musician, yet uh, musicians of his time in France would not play, we, they would refuse to play under his baton um, because he was a mulatto. Um, what every history book will tell you is that he was later, he was a, a fencer and he, he got, actually he was later known as, as the Black Mozart, which I guess was some kind of a compliment. Anyway, um, there is any research on, on Boulogne will tell you they will celebrate the fact that he was that great fencer. He, you know, he, he was given the, tatier, the title of Chevalier from Louis XV at the, at the uh, chagrin of the French nobility, I'm sure. Uh, Boulogne fenci fencing's um, achievements were, um, well, they could not be ignored or denied. After all, anyone could tell which of the fencers was left standing, um, sometimes a matter of Laugh and death, literally. Uh, musical aesthetics or, or worthiness, on the other hand, was left to interpretation. So here, another rabbit hole that I will not get that go down, the athleticism of Black folks to the detriment of, of their mental or musical abilities. Um, let's see. Uh, over the last 
few centuries, uh, there has been a concerted effort to exclude BIPOC artists from the classical stage. Uh, this took many forms. The, the most obvious, slavery, duh. Um, but let's not, let's not discount the effects of underfunding uh, through redlining or other housing tactics or underrepresentation in the government, uh, socioeconomic disparities, blunt, um, blunt policies that restrict access to arts programs and, and, and the more subtle one was invalidation of their art, invalidation of their work. Uh, Diana also in a remark reminded how many music programs did not teach about music of BIPOC composers, except for a few. And for example, I would say Scott Joplin, uh, but you know, they were sure to make a point that uh, to label his music, rag music. So again, just that little micro uh, micro note there. You now this is rag music versus classical music. You know this this the thought that we did not know about a lot of BIPOC composers. This this left many of us, uh, including myself, with to doubt our abilities. Um, and those who dared anyway to to compose were often left with a sense of of uh, what I will label uh, imposters syndrome you know your music was not as valued it was it you just simply can't measure up and we have to address the fact that boardrooms or 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 committees of of granting organizations were made of at best predominantly white folks with just a few non-white members whose votes were simply overruled in the democratic process and at worst uh, composed of just white men. Uh, this contributed to the negative stereotyping of BIPOC compositions. What lenses are they judging this music from? I do not need to go on and on about all of this. I mean, we, we know that this was an obvious, we know that this is an obvious problem. Uh, the question is, what are we, our generation, what are we going to do about it? What will they say about us? Uh, our generation when the history books are written or revised? You know, did we redefine uh, what we consider classical music or did we maintain, did we sustain this, this um, Eurocentric, you know, standard of, you know, set by a bunch of dead white European guys? Um, but to that point, let me offer just a little tidbit. Um, BIPOC composers can sound as generically white as any other composer. Uh, this, this we had to do to survive, be accepted, or be rec recognized, uh, which brings me to, um, I know we, I have to double, double time here, uh, brings to uh, still around uh, the composition. If we did a, a drop the needle, and I know I'm sort of dating myself with a drop the needle thing, but let me rephrase this for, for the young guns, uh, for the young people out there. If we heard, if you heard a fragment of the piece, and I, I think we played a little bit uh, earlier, um, stripped of any information, would you be able to tell, would you be able to, to label this as a comp composition from a, back, from a black Haitian composer? Um, I seem to think not, probably not. Um, there are BIPOC composers who decide to identify themselves as, as such in their compositions using sounds or instruments or harmonic language that are typical to their native lands, but others will not. You know, if we take a look at, let's take a look at the, at Still Around, you know, on its face, it's a um, highly dissonant setting of a poem. Uh, architecturally, it is a theme and variation. Well, that's just a European form, which, by the way, is not unique to European classical music. You know, a lot of folk music have used that theme and variation. An additional technique that I used in Still Around is the soggetto cavato, which means that uh, you take the name of someone and then you, uh, you fashion a melody, the theme, or uh, using the letters of, of, of the name. Uh, for example, um, uh, Ruth, the, the, compo the, poet, the poet is Ruth Baumler Schmidt. And Ruth, you know, I did take some artistic license here. Not, not every letter can be made into, into a note. 
But if you take R-U-T-H, R I use as Re, which is the, the French for uh, D. And U-T is the French, you know, Ut, Do, also German. Uh, and H is the German notation for B natural. So if you look at just the opening, it's D, C, B natural. Uh, and then it goes on and on, it goes on and on like that. Uh, as for the theme and variation, you know, theme and variations can take many forms. And, and there I decided to use the title of the poem, which is still around. And, uh, you know, if you analyze each variation, you know, you'll find that uh, the name of the poet, Ruth Baumler Schmidt, is still around in, if, if, you know, in every one of those variations. So the poem begins, um, I am not your, I am not your substitute mother, uh, not your watchful, watchful silent father. I'm not your whole life's answer, uh, but I'm still around. You know, each verse ends with, but I'm still around. The reason for the discordant approach um, is because the poet reminds her partner of all those hurtful, inconsiderate, or unpleasant things that have at times reared their ugly heads during the, during the marriage or partnership. Uh, yet, in spite of all this, she is still around. You know, this piece ends with a more positive note, pardon the pun, uh, to symbolize the, the love that binds to people. Um, you know, we're not all, we, have, we all have faults. So we must excuse those of others, especially uh, those of one person who, with whom you've, you've made a vow to. You know, what, what makes this a Haitian piece? Well, I, I, I think nothing. You know, it's not the harmonic language. It's not the rhythm. It's not the instrument. The only difference is it was written by a Haitian-born composer. That's the only reason why it is a Haitian piece. You know, and I, th I think that's where the, the title of the, the CD, Tambou Caché, I mean, that's where the hidden part is. You know, this piece written by a Haitian composer that you could probably not tell is a Haitian piece. Uh, for the sake of time, let's move on to Brother Malcolm. Hey, Rudy. Yes. Could I play just a little bit of the piece oh, sure, you were talking about? Great. So we know, have a context. Perfect. Um, well, let's see, should I, no, I think we need to move on to Brother Malcolm. Um, Brother Malcolm was written um, to, to mark the, the ascension of a black man to the presidency of the United States. You know, I heard at the time, you know, 2008, a lot of hopeful talks and, you know, euphoria, uh, you know, Racism is over, all, all of that, uh, you know, uh, following that inauguration. Yet my gut was telling me also that this, this could be short-lived. You, you know, the, the piece is a, a fictional conversation between Martin Luther King and Malcolm X following the ascension of Barack Obama as 44th president of the United States. You know, if it begins with the greeting, um, brother Malcolm, have you heard the news? And, and then you have the reply, uh, Brother Martin, I did hear the news. Uh, the two men continue their, 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 their conversation in slightly different harmonic language. You know, I decided to use the conventional image of the two men to differentiate them. Um, I realized that by doing so, I, I'm sort of, I've become part of the problem, the problem that portrays Malcolm X as this hate-filled individual and 
who would try to reach uh, any of his goals, you know, eight, all the goals by by any means necessary. You know, the the reality is that the the two men had more in common than we have been led to believe. You know, they were simply two sides of the same coin, the same goal. They both wanted the same thing, and especially in the in the later years of Malcolm X, you know, he he was promoting this sort of. Uh, all the races coming together. Anyway, let's let's move on from there. Um, what um, so I picture this the the more peaceful MLK with a much less dissonant harmonic language, and I say much less dissonant because yes, we all humans, and he had this temper, and sometimes would we've we've seen uh, places where he kept his his anger in check, but then the words were very pointed, very very pointed. You know, so I, I use that much less dissonant sound for MLK and the more militant voice of uh, Malcolm X is heard in a very more disagreeable tone, should we say. You know, Malcolm X is, is the one that warns in the piece uh, that, that there will be hell to pay for this audacity. You know, the, the America that, that he knew and that I felt at the time was not ready for this kind of, this kind of a change, that we would suffer uh, some serious backlash from there. And here we are. Uh, scattered around um, the piece are fragments of, of the South African national anthem, Kosi uh, Sikilil Africa. Uh, it's, it's, it is never heard in its entirety and is often hidden. But once you know what it is or what to look for, you know, it, it is, it, you know, you will find that it was hiding in plain sight. The, the more ex- explicit iteration of that, uh, that fragment is at the very end of the piece, uh, or, or maybe a hopeful message that Africa, in this case, African-Americans uh, and all others of African heritage will stand together to reclaim their freedom and, and rightful place in society. Um, Could I play a little bit of it? Sure. I was hoping you would. Thank you. The you know, diversity in the arts, in everything in the boardroom, um, diversity of opinion is not a prob- problem. It is it is a solution. Now the same uh, the same is true in classical music. You know to get to get there. However, we need to redefine what we consider classical music. We need to reimagine diversity, equity, and 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 inclusion. Uh, it's not it's not a box to be checked. You know, from a business framework, you have publishing houses who simply would not publish music of of African Americans or people of African descent. And and hence the the scarcity. You can you can hardly find them, you know, uh, the publish. And even some of those I I, I know for example Justin Lee who was published by Chester uh, the music is out of print now. You you can't find it anymore. Um, so that choice that that choice to not print the music um, is simply to meet the bottom line. You know, people, it's sort of that cycle uh, because there is no demand for it. They won't print it, and because they don't print it, people don't know about it, and they you know they, it's that continued cycle. You know, the uh, the internet has been this great equalizer uh, for a little bit. Uh, there's still some huge hurdles uh, to, you know, during the, on the internet because there's still access. You still have to have the, the financial means to be able to present your music. You have to, you have to promote your music. You have to have the, all the networks. You have to have all the connections uh, to, 
to have your music known so that others can commission you to write music. So again, that yet another little cycle that we just need to get rid of um, simply because someone is, is not of that lineage, uh, we, we decide, well, I'll wait for somebody else to do the commission and then I will, I will start playing it once they've been proven uh, to be uh, good music. So we have to change the lens by which we, we, we view certain music, by, by, by we judge certain things. Um, now to that end, you know, I, I've, I recently started my own publishing house uh and not to say that i couldn't get now certain other houses to to publish my music but at this point it it makes it doesn't make sense for me to do it because they all ask for 75 80 percent of of the earnings it's like they did nothing for that uh, I want to read the rewards of my own work, of my, my own creativity. So I've started my own publishing firm. Yes, it's going to be difficult to get, get it out there and you know, then have to deal with all those to accompany that accompany being able to, to get your music played. But um, I've been doing well. I've been doing okay so far. It's not so much about making a living. Fortunately, I have, I have the means to use uh, my work as my bread and butter and then to the composition is because I have something to say because I, I think it's important for people to to hear the, my point of view. Um, I compose because I have something to say. I compose because there are certain things that are not being addressed and Music is a sort of good vehicle because it's, it's much more palatable. You can hear a piece of music and you don't have to go into the conversation right away. You can simply, it's out there, you start, you hear it. Everyone loves music. They, they want to hear it. And you can decide that uh, what you heard, you know, harmonically, well, okay, so that's a little too out there. And I know a few people, we're still around, they come to me and say, well, you know, that piece is it's hard to sit through. It's, it's hard. Well, yeah, uh, life is life is rough, and you know marriage can be rough. Partnership is rough, uh, whatever that is. So you write the way you feel it, uh, and is it worth it? Well, at the end of still around, I say it is worth it. You know, you still have that feeling of after all of the struggle, I will still be around. You know, I will still be here for you, and. I Absolutely. So I think you have a fantastic advocate in Diana and, and her, her performance of your music is very uh, evocative of the things you are talking about and the commitment that is, that is needed on the part of the artist, uh, in this case, the cellist. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it back to the cello society because that's who we are and, and, and what we're focused on is the, the voice of the cello and, and, and how we can expand our repertoire and look into uh, music that is, that is not read, readily available, as you are pointing out, that is not taught, that is not um, uh, part of the canon. But it's our job to make it part of the canon and as artists. And in an organization like the Cello Society, something that I see it heading towards and I boy do I want to steer the ship in this direction is um, is is for young young people people of color people of uh, underrepresented uh, in any uh, sort of institutional or academic situation um, have have an opportunity to have their music played and that's a nice segue if Stacy is still with us Stacy Krim uh, is a, a hero and champion of the cello world. She is a uh, curator of the uh, Blakeney Hodges and uh, special collections of, of music archive at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro, and someone I've had quite a lot of contact with over the years. Um, and uh, I want her to talk a little bit, if she would, about um, the fact that well, I will talk about the fact that the VCS archive that dates back to the 1950s and the American Cello Council, which was sort of the precursor to the Cello Society, which dates back to the 1930s, 
all of that material is now living happily at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. And as time goes on, we will be uh, putting a lot of that stuff online. And, and one of the things that I think is a, dr a dramatic opportunity for the VCS is to create a living archive. Uh, again, the title of this presentation, that people who are alive today can participate, can write, can find uh, a, a a place within this organization and this group of artists, and hopefully uh, a global uh, audience for for music for the cello. So, Stacy, are you still there? I am still here, and my cat is on my lap, so I apologize if I get blotted out. Um, first of all, thank you so much. This has been just the most amazing um, conversation to hear today uh, from all points of view, the scholarly, the performer, and the composer point of view. Um, and it's been stated in some ways throughout this presentation, going back to how music is going to be preserved in the historical record. Um, an archive is going to take in the works of of composers and performers, typically. Um, I'm also especially interested in small publishers because they're they're very vulnerable in producing some of the, the best music out there these days. So when you look at a performer's collection, you're going to see the pieces that they performed, which goes back to uh, the significance of what Kate was saying is that we need to have this material included in what is being performed at, by performers at all levels um, for it to be really uh, making it into the historic record. Um, archives are uh, making great strides and greater representation of composers and performers in their collections. We're still gonna have to deal with some baggage because we are historical in nature. So um, it will take us a little while for us to catch up um, because we always are going to be 50 to 75 years out of date. Um, but uh, what, I, the, what I can say is encourage performers to perform uh, music of underrepresented populations, um, encourage performers of underrepresented populations to, uh, to make their works, their uh, performances public so more people can experience this. Um, it's really important that audiences get to experience this music. Um, and uh, I think technology has been a, a tremendous avenue for that. And composers need support. Um, so uh, certainly if ever you're interested in diversifying, um, music librarians and archivists are eager to help you, uh, help expose you to music you may not be aware of. Um, I'm certainly, I will certainly do my best, but I'm certain many of you um, are associated with institutions that can help as well. And I am so excited about Kate's support uh, and future initiative of hopefully getting a, a program started to support the, um, the uh, funding of compositions by BIPOC composers. Thank you so much. That was a really fantastic way to to sort of put a put a bracket around this this wonderful evening. Um, I want to open it up to anybody who's who's been here, who has a question, a comment, uh, you know, a constructive criticism. <laughs> uh, Bloom Haiti has a comment. Let me unmute you. Uh, my hand was up by accident. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Well, we're a year glad the to pandemic, have you. I would know by now, but I, I, I. <laughs> there it goes. It's okay. No comment. Just to say congratulations to um, to you, Kate, and to Diana and Rebecca and Rudy for their terrific work. Now, can you tell me a little bit about what Bloom Haiti is? I love the. Uh... This is a, a nonprofit organization. Uh, Bloom stands for Building Leaders Using Music Education in Haiti. And uh, I've been going to Haiti since 1996. Actually, Rebecca's first trip to Haiti was uh, when she was a student at Lawrence University, where I taught for many years. And um, uh, yeah, so I've been involved in Haiti for a long, long time and love the music. I posted in the chat their um, uh, names of some composers who've done some fabulous cello ensemble pieces, if you're interested in that. Um, and these are relatively uh, easily available 
by contacting the composers who are on Facebook, or you can Google their names and find find their works. So. Fantastic. Thank you. I copied all the links that people put in the chat, so it'll go into our little archive on the website. There'll be a recording of most of this talk. <laughs> I managed to get the, the, the button pushed. So um, uh, anybody else like to... Oh, yes, Elizabeth Landers would like to say something. Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, Robin Derby is my advisor at UCLA. So thank you, Robin, for inviting me. This was absolutely a wonderful experience. I, I found myself thinking, and perhaps this is a question for Houthi, um, what possible avenues do you see in promoting classical music within Haiti to uh, allow it to kind of reach and speak a potentially broader audience within the country? Uh, our biggest issue, I, I would say right now, are the lack of, of um, on a daily basis, on a continual uh, basis, uh, teachers. Um, it's that constant training um, of the teachers that, that's, that's missing. We, we, we have volunteers like Janet and Diana and, and Rebecca who would come down and for a short time, uh, you know, Janet is a honorary Haitian at this point, you know, they come, they come down and, and, and teach, but then the rest of the year, um, they, they have to make do with whatever, uh, whatever they, they think they know. Um, promoting that I, I, you know, I, I may be biased, but I, I find Haitians are extremely gifted for for all kinds of music, not just not just the compai and, and all of those pop music, popular music, but also um, classical music. You know, I'm working with some young through Zoom. I'm working with some uh, violinists and 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 others, and also uh, another composer. Uh, a young composer is just starting. I is doing some really wonderful thing, but then it it it's just. Uh, it's very difficult uh, to get not only to get this music played. Um, it, it's it's you know it, there's still a lot of mistakes, you know, sort of rookie mistakes that that they're making. So if we can get on a more regular basis, pe pe people that come down and 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 I would say the same people all the time because then there's there's the sort of that um, follow through. With everything that's going on, rather than oh yeah, try this way, and then somebody else comes in over and, and says, okay, I want you to focus on this, and then, so that 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 can be good as well because it makes makes you very versatile, it makes you adapt to adapt to all situation. So in order to, to promote classical music in Haiti, uh, you, you, we need instruments, we need teachers, and because they already have the passion and and the and and the talent. Uh, so those two are the biggest ingredients. Nikolai, would you like to say something? Yeah, um, I just want to add uh, what Rudy said. Uh, we are fellows in the same uh, state. Uh, he's in Blue Time in St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, um, I'm also a cellist, but uh, also a musicologist. And I, uh, I want to add uh, that it's very difficult to promote uh, culture which is uh, not uh, uh, not uh, known here. I do this in the 20, uh, 19 years uh, in uh, Twin Cities uh, with my Balkan uh, contemporary chamber music. Uh, what I do and uh, plus folk, but uh, as far as folk music is more popular, but particular classical music from culture like the Balkans that nobody knows is very difficult to promote uh, and to try to find the venues and way to get the people interested uh, in this. Uh, so um, basically the circle of uh, people who are attending this concert is uh, Almost not the same, but uh, it's hard to grow. I, I completely understand uh, Rudy's uh, problem with the Haiti's music as well. Uh, anyway, so uh, that was very, very important uh, thing that Rudy mentioned about and said uh, the how we to promote this music. Yeah. Well, now the, on the underlying issue is um, is again that definition of what is classical music. What do we define as classical music? So if we if we cannot expand that definition, then all of those all of those genres are going to have a hard time finding, you know, uh, a stream, finding a way to get heard. 
But if we can broaden that that definition of what we consider classical music or accept accept certain music, um, accept the music and put it on the stage, and then it it's a lot easier. But as long as we've got this those blinders on, it's like we're gonna do Brahms and Schubert and and Shostakovich. Uh, it's gonna be very hard for other types of music to to come in. We we've got I have um, you know some of those composers. They want to write in the style of, you know, they, you know, Mozart or wh whatever. But of those accepted genres, uh, well, why, why not write in your own style? Why not take, you know, Bartok did all that research. You know, Kodai the same thing. You know, uh, those ethnomusicologists. You want to take the music of your country and then put it on the stage with your sound, with your instrument, everything else. So that narrow-minded view of what we say is classical music is is killing classical music. So I, I on, on that note, I'm going to kind of bring it back. But um, I, I thank everybody for being here tonight and for such brilliant people with such interesting things to say. And uh, check out those links. Check out Diana's album. Please contact Rudy and the other composers who are who are who are there? Oh, I see L Loretta's uh, raising her hand. Loretta, do you want to say something? Or oh, she's clapping. I'm sorry, she's applauding. <laughs> That's my 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 Zoom uh, noviceness at hand here. Um, and our next presenter is there on the right. Terry King is going to the marvelous Terry King is going to give a presentation um, on none other than Gregor Piatigorsky and uh, his wonderful book that I'm just eating each page of. It's just so delicious. Um, that will happen in a month from now, third Monday of May, which is the 17th, I think. Um, so thanks for joining us, everybody. Thanks so much, everyone. It was a fascinating evening and uh, look forward to seeing you all again, May 17th. Stay on our list, join the site, join the VCS, bring your friends. It's lots of fun. We always have a good time. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.